So we're all aware about the ongoing Aguna crisis. But a major aspect that is also being discussed is that of abuse. And in many of these cases, unfortunately, there is emotional abuse where the woman feels trapped. There's verbal abuse where there's screaming and name calling and foul language. And unfortunately, there's also physical abuse where people are unfortunately physically abused. And I wanted to talk today about my own experiences with abuse. You see, growing up in my house, um, I was abused in all these categories. There were many, many nights where I cried myself to sleep that I wondered how could the world be such a cruel place? I lost faith in humanity, I lost faith in people. Many years of my life I chose not to believe in God. It can't be that I could be a part of a world where such a thing could exist and there's absolutely no way to turn. There's no answers. I felt helpless. I wondered, why is this happening to me? You know, when I was in, when I was in elementary school, I remember being called into the psychologist's office. And the psychologist asked me to look at some paint blobs. And he asked me, what do you see in the picture? And I remember telling him, I see a dad beating up his son. A couple days later, my father killed me, verbally abused me, pushed me to the floor. How dare you tell the school that I'm doing such and such to you? Do you know that they called the cops and the cops now came and now I have to worry about this mess because of something that you did. It was my fault that the police came to my house to look into what my father was doing to me. I had a knot in my stomach most nights wondering, is today going to be the day that my dad decides to get extra angry and drag me down the stairs and throw me out of the house. Some nights it was 20 degrees outside. I didn't have a jacket, I didn't have shoes on my feet. I was left outside alone in the cold, just crying. My life changed when I was in high school. There was a very pivotal moment in my life that absolutely shape-shifted the trajectory of where I ultimately headed. You see, one day I was in school, I was in Mag and David High School, and I was using my iPod. Teacher took away the iPod and she said, you gotta go to the principal to retrieve it. After class, went to the principal, and I'm convinced to this day that God himself put the words in the principal's mouth of what he told me. He said to me something very peculiar that I've never heard before. He said, you can have the iPod back when your father comes to pick it up. Usually in a case like this, they'd say your mother or your parents why in the world he chose to say just dad, I don't know. But at that moment in time, I broke down hysterically crying. Because for years and for years, I had all of this emotional damage that I was keeping within. When my parents were divorced, I was mandated to go to therapy. I went to SPH, to a counselor, and I chose not to speak because I told myself, people who go to therapy are weak. 
people who go to therapy are losers. I'm not weak. And I refuse to speak. But deep down in my heart, I knew the real reason. The real reason was I was embarrassed. The real reason was I said, I know I have very intimate secrets that if I share it with another human being, my life will be destroyed. And I was so busy and I was so worked up on trying to maintain an image that I wanted everybody to have of me that I refused to let anybody in. And so on that day in high school in Nagin David Yeshiva where I broke down hysterically crying, the principal knew that there was a problem. And he didn't know how to handle it. He sent me to the guidance counselor. I walk into the office and in the background he has music playing. Happened to be, it was Rascal Flats. Happened to be my favorite band at the time. It took five minutes for the guidance counselor to tell me about his own past, with his own troubles, with his own dad, and the rest was history. My life changed forever because I had another human being on planet Earth who knew how I felt, who, who sympathized with me, who gave me a safe space to talk and to share about me and to tell me everything is not okay right now, but it will be okay because I am with you and we will get through it together. This man doesn't know this, but Andrew Leibowitz saved my life. Because God knows where I could have ended up if it wasn't for that moment where somebody threw me a lifeline. Now you might be wondering, as an eighth grade boy, what can I do? I want to help. I feel for all of these cases and for all the women and the children, but I can't do anything. There's nothing I can do. And I'm here to tell you that that is false. Fake news. You can do something. Because you want to know what also helped me get through the most difficult, darkest times of my life? It was my friends. You see, I was that kid that never wanted to be home because when I was home, I didn't know what would happen to me and I didn't feel safe. But I knew that when I was out of my house, I would be okay. So I literally spent more time in my friends' houses than I did my own. And my friends saved my life. They did. Because in the toughest times, when I didn't feel like there was a reason to live this life, there were other human beings who said, come play ball, come play Xbox, let's go to the pizza store. And sometimes it wasn't even that complicated. Sometimes all somebody needed to do for me was to just tell me good morning. Was to just say, hey, you played great at the game the other day. And that comment was enough to get me through that day. It made me feel like, okay, maybe this world isn't that bad. Maybe there is something to being a part of this world. Now, thank God for me, I survived. And I'm damn proud to say that I did, but I can tell you that it was difficult and that I could not do it on my own. I have been afforded tremendous people in my life. My mother, who was a superhero, who worked three full-time jobs to put us through school, who has been there every single day by my side to help me with any crisis in the world. Community leaders who have offered their time and their expertise and their wisdom to mentor me and to advise me on what it is that I could do differently to navigate life. Friends, teachers, family members, you name it, I had it. But the harsh reality is that many people don't have what I did. And many people are out there today suffering, struggling, wondering what will today bring? 
Is this day a day that I want to live? Probably not. You want to know what you can do? You just have to be yourself. A good, nice person, part of Am Yisrael, who says, it doesn't matter who, and it doesn't matter when, I do the right thing, simply because it's the right thing to do. Not because I get a cookie, not because I get a medal, but simply because I know Borei Olam put me on this earth to make the world a better place. And so when I have an opportunity to tell another human being good morning, I do it. When I have an opportunity to invite a friend over to play, I do it. When I have an opportunity to give a compliment, even if it's not my friend, even if you're not boys, regular person, hey, nice shirt. Hey, that's an awesome bicycle, whatever. You always have an opportunity to make another human being feel good, and that is enough. Because if enough of us collectively do what we can to lift each other up, you might be saving the next Aaron Shasha. We have no idea who these people are. Nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew that I was suffering. And it took a random iPod incident for me to break down hysterically crying and end up in a guidance counselor's office that changed the trajectory of my life. But we can't rely on fluke instances. We can't rely on these concepts that we can't control. We can only do us. And so let's make a commitment today that every single day we live life to the fullest and we recognize that we have a fundamental goal to make the world a better place. And so the way we speak and the way we act and the way we interact with human beings, irrespective of who they are. Doesn't matter what they look like, doesn't matter what they sound like, I don't care what their last name says, I don't care how much money they have in their bank account or lack thereof. They're a human being, they have an ishama, they were put on this earth by Borei Olam, that's enough. That's the only criteria I need to know that I have a moral responsibility to do something in this moment. What I went through was very difficult. Cried myself to sleep many nights. Every single person in this room and every single person in our community and in the world has the power, without knowing it, to change somebody else's life. What will you decide and how are you going to move forward in response to this crisis? That's it.